Why do trig functions appear in Euler's formula? This was the question I had when I first saw Euler's formula. This connection between trigonometry and exponents seems so unexpected, especially along with complex numbers. To answer this question, we must journey into the intricate and beautiful mathematical relationship between trig functions, E, and complex numbers. We will look at two different ways to approach this question, one using dynamics, geometry, and the complex plane, and the other using Taylor and Maclaurin series. Both are equally fascinating, and both reach the same amazing result by using a lot of beautiful math. Triangles are one of the most powerful mathematical objects in geometry, because you can describe many polygons and circles with triangles. I would argue that the most powerful of all triangles is the right triangle. Its right angle allows for connections between rectangles and squares, giving rise to relations like Pythagorean's theorem. Additionally, a right triangle can be formed in a circle using the radius as a hypotenuse, allowing the properties of triangles and circles to blend together. Thus, from this powerful triangle come trigonometric functions, functions that relate the angle of a right triangle to its sides. Now, these functions have great applications in many various aspects of mathematics, but let's focus on the unicircle or a circle of radius 1. If the unicircle is on the origin of the coordinate plane, we can draw a right triangle by using the origin, a point on the circle, and a point on the x-axis inside the boundaries of the circle. There are a few things to note for this triangle. First, the angle of the triangle on the origin is equal to its length of the arc traced by the triangle. This makes sense since the radius is 1 and the length of an arc traced by the central angle is r theta. Additionally, since the radius is 1 and the radius is the hypotenuse of the triangle, the hypotenuse of the triangle is also 1. This is where our trig functions sine and cosine come into play. Sine theta is defined as the ratio between the side opposite of our angle theta and the hypotenuse, but since our hypotenuse is 1, sine theta is actually equal to the opposite side. Similarly, since cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, cosine theta is equal to the adjacent side. Therefore, this point on the circle which coincides with the triangle can actually be described as cosine theta sine theta. In fact, this is where polar coordinates come from. Polar coordinates are described by r, the distance from the origin, and theta, the angle from the x-axis. These polar coordinates r theta can be converted back into Cartesian coordinates x, y as x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. What we just did was apply this idea for r equals 1 since we're on a unicircle. Anyways, what we're left with is a way to describe every point on this circle by the angle on the origin using a right triangle, using the definition of sine and cosine and the fact that we're on a unicircle. Now, I want to move away from trig functions for a bit and talk about complex numbers. Complex numbers are numbers with the form a plus b i, where a and b are real numbers, and i is the imaginary constant square root of negative 1. Therefore, a complex number can be described by its real and imaginary parts, and thus cannot be represented on the real number line. Instead, complex numbers are represented in a two-dimensional plane called the complex plane, with a real axis and imaginary axis. This 2D representation of a set of numbers means that we can do pretty interesting things with them. First, multiplying by i results in a 90-degree rotation counterclockwise along the complex plane. You can already kind of see it from the definition of i. I mean, i squared is negative 1. If we multiply by i, we get i cubed is negative i, then i to the fourth is 1, then i to the fifth back to i, and so on. If you represent this on the complex plane, it's like every time we multiply by i, we're rotating around 90 degrees counterclockwise in the complex plane. For example, if we multiply 2 plus 3i by i, we get negative 3 plus 2i, which is a 90 degree rotation of 2 plus 3i counterclockwise. This property of rotation will come up later, so just put it in the back of your mind. Let's come back to trig functions. Due to the fact that the complex numbers are described in 2D space, we can represent the unit circle, right triangles, and polar coordinates all on the complex plane. The only difference is that the points on the circle are not represented by Cartesian coordinates, but rather a complex number, specifically cosine theta plus i sine theta. Thus, a point on this unit circle, that is theta radians around the circle, or theta units around the circumference of the circle, can be described with a complex number cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now, let's turn our approach to the exponential function. In calculus, you learn that e to the x is a very special function because the derivative of e to the x is equal to e to the x. Now, if you don't know what a derivative is, let me quickly explain. The derivative of a function at some point is how the function changes at that specific point. For example, 
if we have a car traveling in a straight line and we have a function that describes the distance it's traveling, the derivative of the function at, let's say, time equals two seconds will be the velocity of the car after traveling for two seconds. So when we say that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, that means that the rate of change of e to the x at any point is e to the x. So what happens if x is multiplied by a constant, let's say 2? Well, we can use what's called the chain rule, which is a method of finding derivatives of composite functions, where the derivative of f of g of x is g prime of x times f prime of g of x. For e to the 2x, the inner function g of x is 2x, so we end up with 2 times e to the 2x, since the derivative of 2x is 2. In fact, for any constant n, the derivative of e to the nx is just n times e to the nx. So what happens if n equals i? That means that the derivative of e to the ix is i times e to the ix. But if you remember, multiplying by i just means a 90 degree rotation at that point counterclockwise. So for the derivative of a function to be i times itself, that means that its rate of change is rotational. So since e to the ix at x equals 0 is 1, the derivative is i. From there, we can trace out a circular pattern, a unicircle in fact, since we start at e to the i0 is 1, with our derivative acting kind of like a tangential velocity. And note that the derivative of i times e to the ix has no real constant changing the function. This means that the magnitude of the derivative, or we can say the speed at which we are tracing this unicircle, stays constant at 1. Therefore, for any x in the expression e to the ix, we can trace around the circle x units or x radians around the center. But didn't we already describe the same motion with trig functions? A point on the circle that is x radians around the unit circle can also be described by cosine x plus i sine x. Since the two expressions describe the exact same thing, we can conclude that they are equal. e to the ix is equal to cosine x plus i sine x. Now, the previous explanation is quite nice as it uses the raw definition of these trigonometric functions and the properties of i and e to forge a unit circle that can be described in the same way. However, a more rigorous proof relies on more calculus. Even so, this next explanation uses another property of trig functions and e to the x that is totally different, but fascinatingly still reaches the same results. In calculus, the idea of Taylor series essentially represents a function as an infinite series. This series is described by using the derivative and higher order derivatives of a function at a point as constants for an infinite polynomial. Additionally, these derivatives are divided by some n factorial to reverse the effects of repeated differentiation. And this is all a very surface level explanation. So essentially what's happening is that the derivatives encode the information of a function around some certain point, such that as more and more terms are added, the polynomial becomes a better and better approximation for the original function. An infinite series of these polynomials is thus represented as this expression, which is called the Taylor series for the function f of x centered around the point c. If we center our derivative at 0, which tend to simplify things, we get a Maclaurin series. Now, these Taylor and Maclaurin series do not always equal the function it represents, but they actually do for a number of very important functions, two of which are sine of x and cosine of x. However, the nature of these trigonometric functions and their derivatives lead to some very interesting Taylor series. If you know basic derivatives, you know that the derivative of sine of x is equal to cosine of x, and the derivative of cosine of x is equal to negative sine of x. This key relationship comes from the definition of sine and cosine. I won't lay out the exact details in this video for the sake of simplicity, but essentially, on a unit circle with a right triangle, we can nudge the center angle theta a small delta theta. If we zoom in on what happens, we can see that this little nudge in theta results in a tiny nudge delta y and delta x. Since sine theta is represented as the y value of this point, the derivative of sine theta is actually delta y over delta theta as this delta theta approaches zero, which is just dy over d theta. As delta theta approaches zero, this arc essentially becomes a straight line. And this entire shape essentially becomes a right triangle, specifically a right triangle that is similar to our original right triangle on the unit circle, with this angle actually approaching theta. Now, we know that cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, and as our delta theta approaches zero, the adjacent and hypotenuse sides of theta become like dy over d theta. Therefore, cosine of theta is the derivative of sine theta. With a similar method, we can show that negative sine theta is the derivative of cosine of theta.
Now, this differential relationship between trig functions result in many interesting properties. For one, higher order derivatives, that is, repeated differentiation of sine and cosine, cycle around sine x, cosine x, negative sine x, and negative cosine of x. Therefore, for a Maclaurin series of these functions, the values of these higher order derivatives also cycle around sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, negative sine of 0 is 0, and negative cosine of 0 is negative 1. Since every other derivative is 0, Every other term for sine and cosine's Maclaurin series is also zero. Specifically, every term with an even degree is gone for the Maclaurin series of sine of x, and every term with an odd degree is gone for the Maclaurin series of cosine of x. Additionally, the signs of the terms alternate for every other second derivative, so that every other term alternates between negative and positive for the Maclaurin series. Finally, since the values of these non-zero derivatives are either 1 or negative 1, we end up with a very simple Maclaurin series for sine of x and cosine of x. However, there is an even simpler Maclaurin series from perhaps the simplest of derivative rules, e to the x. Since any ordered derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, and e to the 0 is 1, the Maclaurin series of e to the x is amazingly simple. The simplistic nature of both e to the x and the trig function's Maclaurin series begs for some connection to be made. But we need a way to change the signs of these functions. This is where the imaginary constant comes in. You may have noticed that the Maclaurin series of e to the x allows for imaginary exponents to actually be calculated. Additionally, as you've discussed before, i has the property of cycling through values as it is exponentiated. We go from i to negative 1 to negative i to 1, a property that parallels the derivative of sine and cosine. So plugging in ix to the series is not only an act of mathematical curiosity. It is a representation of a hidden connection between two aspects of mathematics. When we plug in ix to the Maclaurin series of the exponential function, every term with an odd degree is attached by the imaginary constant. Thus, we can separate the terms by real and imaginary, such that all the real terms have an even degree and all the imaginary terms have an odd degree. As a side note, you cannot always manipulate the orders of the terms on an infinite series, but the series we're using is absolutely convergent, which means we can rearrange the terms however we like. Anyways, note that the cycling of signs for the exponents of i result in an alternating pattern of signs for the two subseries. Look what we have. We have the exact Maclaurin series for cosine of x, and i times the exact Maclaurin series for sine of x. Therefore, we result with e to the i x is equal to cosine x plus i sine x. Today, we looked at two approaches to deciphering the connection between exponentials and trigonometry as shown in Euler's formula. It is really amazing how so many different tools and concepts in mathematics can come together to such a simple and powerful result. So I hope you learned something new. This is my first time explaining a topic using Manim on YouTube, so there's always room for improvement. But I'm planning on making more videos, so if you'd like to, consider subscribing. Other than that, thank you so much for watching.